daughter was asking me the other day, like, why do you, why can't you remember? Like, she can remember stuff from when she was in preschool. Like, yeah. Like, don't you remember that kid named so and so and his parents? And I was like, how can you remember this? And it's like, I think I'm just so focused on like the obligations of the day, or, like what I have to do to to be a proper parent for the yeah. next 24 hours or something. That just the the memory just gets uh, <laughs> erased quickly or more quickly than I, I'm used to. Is that different than it was before? As I was reading an interview you did this morning when the book came out the first time, and you essentially said that once something's out in the world, you, you never revisit it. it. The files kind of closed on that. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's, um, I've sort of given up on on doing any more work on it yeah. you know I, I sort of feel like why bother looking at it anymore because uh i i do have that i think it's a pretty common cartoonist problem of like having difficulty letting go of something kind of feeling like you could always keep tinkering with it and unfortunately that's been sort of reinforced for me over the years because i'll make a big fuss and tell my publisher oh no we got to hold up the release i got to i got to figure out something i got to fix this thing and then i'm generally rewarded by that because I'm like, yeah, I really actually, that yeah. was pretty important. I'm glad I, I fixed that. What sorts of things are holding it up? I mean, is it just little art things or are there it's important everything. It storytelling can, it can problems? Be, yeah, it could be everything. It can be art things. It can be uh, changing a few words around in, yeah. a, in, a, in a word balloon. Colors. I mean, that's a total rabbit hole to go down now with computer coloring, you know, because you can tinker by five percent i've had the same conversation with a lot of musicians and they've told me that the, you know i guess like pro tools now as far as recording quality is concerned is it's almost indistinguishable for most people right but the thing that kills a lot of them is it allows you to fiddle with every single instrument yeah. and every single level and people end up just doing it until there's basically nothing left yeah yeah and and, and it can be it can be self-defeating too obviously yeah. i mean that's why at a certain point i i I haven't completely gone insane and I'm not still tinkering on this book, you know, like I have to force myself to, to let it go at a certain point. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, I, I admire the artists who can work quickly and, and, and be satisfied, you know, with good enough and just yeah. get it out there and, and sort of build a different kind of career where it's like, not everything is perfect, but there's such a quantity and variety of things that it sort of amounts to a, an interesting resume. You know, that's always been an envy of mine. You know, there's certain, I guess it applies to filmmakers mm -hmm. too. Like there's people who just like, um, you know, like Steven Soderbergh. Yeah. Just like, or music. I mean, yeah. any art form really. Yeah, really. Like it's, do you, do you sort of, you know, meticulously work on one thing for a long time yeah. and put that out and then slowly ease into the next one or do you just keep putting stuff out there and you know some of it sticks and some of it doesn't I get the feeling from a lot of cartoonists you know we had we had chris ware on the show a right. couple months ago and he wouldn't really admit this to me but i've always got this impression from him especially you know reading his sketchbooks that he's got maybe a sense of jealousy for those artists who are able to just to whom it seems it comes natural yeah. you know the people who there's all this talk about channeling the muse and inspiration and things like that. And, you know, the people who really sort of spend a lot of time in something and kill themselves over something seem to envy the people who, who can just sort of sit down and whip something out. Yeah, I certainly do. I, I came from a generation of cartoonists, or I'm sort of the descendant of a generation yeah. of cartoonists that uh, worked in a very meticulous slow way. And after I'd sort of settled into that process, I started to become aware of a lot more, uh, I feel like slightly younger cartoonists mm -hmm. who came up and um, were working in a quicker, more relaxed way. And they've been around for a while now, but I remember at the time when like Jeffrey Brown showed up yeah. or uh, Vanessa Davis, mm -hmm. um, people like that, where it was, it almost looked like you know, a, a peek into a really well done sketchbook or something, or like or, that. or diary comic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Really people I writing about just being so envious yeah. of that of that way of working. When you work as I don't know if minimalist is the right word, but um, w when you work in that form, like there's there's not a lot of there's not a, a lot of room for error. There's not a lot of room for mistakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single line has to essentially serve a purpose. Right. Was it really sort of the influence of, of like a Dan Klaus or, um, you know, a Jaime Hernandez? Or was that just something, a style that you were already working in at the time? It it sort of was um, just a uh, synchronicity kind yeah. of thing of um, just, be, I, you know, I before I had ever been exposed to those guys' work, I was just a naturally 
kind of obsessive, meticulous yeah. uh, worker just even as a kid. Like that was um, sort of the path I was already headed down. And then when I saw their work, I didn't know them. I didn't know anything about how they created it, but it was very attractive to me and, and it appealed to me. And then it was sort of interesting to then later find out that they were pretty careful and, and conscientious workers, not like slapping paint down on a canvas. Yeah. Illustration is really kind of a perfect fit for you, right? I mean, you're yeah. able to really spend that time on one specific image. Right. I mean, I've I've come to to enjoy it. I think when I was younger, I was so focused on my comics work that that was sort of of utmost importance. And, and I felt in some ways that illustration work was an intrusion upon yeah. that. And it was more of a compromised collabor- collaborative. Was there a sense that it was sort of like selling out? Not so much that, but just, it was just, kind of a necessary distraction from yeah. what I really wanted to be doing, which was making comics. And at this point, I mean, I, I think it's also worth noting that the, the clients that I was working for then are maybe a little different than, than sure. the list that I have now. It's, so. it's not the cover of The New Yorker. <laughs> right, exactly. So there, there maybe there was some more justification for the, the gritting of my teeth back then. But now I, I, I really look forward to it. A lot of my friends have tried to phase out the illustration part of the of the job and, and made room just to work on their comics. But I've sort of stuck with it, mainly because I really enjoy it. I like having a break from a long-term project and doing something that will start and end within a week and get out into the world. And found that even though it slows me down and sometimes breaks my momentum on my lo- longer comics projects, that I'm usually grateful for that little break, and I go back and I, I see things very differently than when I was just locked into the into the process, and I, I am able to make corrections and, and adjustments directly based on taking a little break. You're probably able to be pretty choosy as well in terms of the projects that you're picking at this point. Yeah, I, it depends on where we are financially. I mean, <laughs> you know, this um, we can we can look at your your portfolio and figure out how your family's doing. Yeah, find out. Time. Yeah, find out. <laughs> Uh, when it's like the KFC ad, we're like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Adrian. Yeah, I mean, that, that plays into it. I yeah. mean, the, the process of making Killing and Dying technically took was about seven years. And, and within that time, I had a lot of changes in my life from you know, my wife was a graduate student hmm. and then she was working on her PhD. Uh, and now she is uh, working full time. And, and so that that's a big change. And we also, I started out... Um, having no kids, and now I've got two kids. Uh, so all those things definitely affect what I choose to choose to work on. Yeah. Um, and so, but but your, to your original question, I am, I think right now in a, in a mostly in, in a nice position where I can work with art directors or companies that I have sort of a relationship with, and it's not like stepping into uncharted territory or anything. Do you work from home? I do work from home, yeah. That must be really difficult with two young children. It is, but it's still, for me, <laughs> better than having to leave the house. Really? Yeah. yeah. For a little while, I rented a, a small room outside of outside of our place, and I set up a whole kind of replica of my studio with the drawing table and, and everything like that. And even though it wasn't that far, there were a lot of days where it would be like, oh, it's snowing. I don't want to have to walk to that to the studio yeah. or, or whatever. And... Um, now that both my kids are in school, there's still a lot of hours of the day where the house is empty. So it, it was just, it made more sense for me just to, to stay at home. Are they old enough to know what you're doing? A little bit. I've got a, a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. Okay. So the eight-year-old definitely sure. does. She was actually reading the uh, the book that I did about, um, basically about her parents getting married, the yeah. scenes from an impending marriage. Yeah. It's been laying around the house, but she, for some reason, just picked it up last night and, and she sat there reading it and she gets it she she knows about the new yorker and, and things like that and my youngest one i'm i'm not sure i'm not sure what she makes it's, of it's it. interesting whether the eight-year-old is at a point where she can contextualize why you're working on one picture for, yeah for like a full week essentially or yeah longer you know i think it's just kids just grow up assuming whatever their parents do is kind of normal and i think for my daughters it's been sort of interesting for them to meet other kids and find out about their parents who have more traditional office jobs yeah. and, and have to travel a lot for work and, and things like that. I got the impression that you felt like 
I don't know, I guess maybe, maybe it's just a symptom of kind of, you know, getting older and having kids, but that time becomes finite of not just because, you know, you actually literally just have less hours during the day, but also essentially like how many more of these books am I going to be able to put out? Right. And, you know, from that standpoint, the book itself takes on a lot more meaning for you as you're working on it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's at least at this point in my life, it's sort of a bit of a quandary because I have that exact thought that you're describing yep. hanging over me all the time. Uh, Mortality. <laughs> yeah. The sort of Damocles. Yeah. And thinking, okay, realistically, how many more books am I going to be able to do? And yep. what all these different ideas, what, let me prioritize them so that I don't, you know, as I'm barely stumbling towards the finish line thinking, but wait, I wanted to do that 800 page graphic novel yep. or something, <laughs> you know. Um, but simultaneous to that, I have the feeling of my kids are only going to be young for so long yep. and they're only going to be at home for so long and they're only going to want to spend time with me <laughs> for so long. So that weighs on me a lot too, which is kind of in direct conflict with, with the other thought. When time does become more finite and, you know, this book t does take on more meaning for you, do you become more precious about it? I mean, do you become more of a perfectionist? Is it harder to send it out into the world? Um, I think if not for the kids, it would, but I think I have some, it's sort of a conflict, but I think it's also a useful balance where there's sort of an appeal to getting stuff out to out into the world, to getting it done, where it's yeah. like, if I finish work for the day, then I can go spend time with my kids and, and you know, be a parent, which in general, I enjoy more than sitting alone at my drawing table. So it's hard to say. I think it kind of, it, it balances out. I think the, the, the parenthood side is sort of winning for me to a degree, because when I finished Killing and Dying, I was sort of thinking about what I was going to do next. And the idea of going deep into a massive multi-year project that was going to sort of consume me sounded like the most horrifying thing I hmm. could I could I could face at that time uh, especially you know at that point my my youngest daughter was a baby still and I just really was more interested in trying to do something that was manageable that I could feel more like I can see the end in sight or each day is sort of a a finite amount of work that I feel okay about stopping at a certain point. But on, on a very pragmatic level, it's it's easier to scrap a three-page story than it yeah. is an eight hundred-page graphic novel. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I mean, I think I think I, I would have had a completely different career if I hadn't had kids. I mean, hmm. I, I'm actually, I'm from the Bay Area myself, mm -hmm. and I've I've been following your stuff for probably like fifteen twenty years yeah. at this point. And you've always been a short story writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, most people in comics start off that way before they take on their massive tome. But that seems to have always been your impulse. I, I, I guess that's right. I think, I, I, but even, even, I guess when I was younger, I think there was some sort of combination of yeah. it, 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 it appeals to me as a reader. I like those kinds of stories. Um, uh, but I think also, I, even, even then to a degree, I had this feeling of, I'm not sure this is the drawing style that I'm going to want to be working with five years from now. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get locked into something. It's basically a fear of commitment, I think, that has uh, pervaded. You do switch it up from from time to time, and there are some examples of that. There are a couple of examples of that in the new book, but you seem to have settled on a pretty well-defined drawing style at this point. I guess so. I, I tried to... I, I mean, my hope was that every story in Killing and Dying would be a little bit yeah. different from, from, from the one that came different, before. Different, yes, but it, I can look at one of your books and know that it, that you're mm -hmm. the one who did it, or I can look at, you know, like some Weezer poster mm -hmm. and know that you're the person who drew it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as though there would be, uh, you know, potentially more of a sense of accomplishment? I mean, is that one of the things that you're, you're working towards? Obviously, like, your stuff has been critically acclaimed over the years, but the stuff that really gets, you know, all of the prizes and everything else are these, are these really big yeah. books. And, yeah. you know, when you talk about sort of that sense of, catharsis or or pride in having finished a project mm -hmm. you don't get any of that instant feedback because it takes you so long to work on it yeah. but the sense that you get when you work on something that's significantly longer yeah is entirely different than a short story yeah yeah well i mean again i think this might be a detriment to my career but i'm <laughs> i'm pretty content with the level of <laughs> acclaim that i've received i don't i don't sit around fuming about <laughs> awards i didn't receive or or I don't look at the success of, of other artists and yeah. feel like, oh, that should have been mine, or I would like to get what they have. I, I think I had that when I was younger, but if, if anything, at this point, I feel like I have been overpraised, or I feel like I've, I've gone further with this 
cartooning thing than than I ever expected to. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I, I've thought about this. I think in, in 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 some ways that it'll make me a lesser cartoonist. Like I don't know if I'm ever going to buckle down and spend twenty years on a historical epic. I didn't see a way forward where I could be that kind of cartoonist who would who would buckle down and engage in a very challenging <laughs> long-term project and also enjoy my life and and yeah. be, be a good parent and a tolerable husband. I mean, I think you have to be superhuman to, to juggle all those things. Yeah. And there, there are plenty of, especially cartoonists, I've noticed, who make the compromise of not enjoying their lives yeah, in I know. order to work on that. Yeah. Some I, people just are, are um, disinclined to enjoying life in general. Yeah. Or, or they enjoy life by working. You know, I mean, I totally understand that. And I, and I felt that way when I was younger, that, that I would be out doing something that I was you know, I I knew to be a fun experience. Yeah. Like I'd be out at a concert or something, and in my mind, I'd be thinking, "I really wish I was back home working." And you know, that that has definitely shifted for me o- over the years. What is that impulse? I mean, I, I get that too. Feeling sometimes it's like, "Hey, I really enjoy my work, and, mm-hmm. and I've got something sitting at home that I I wish I can't wait to get back to." Yeah. But but there's also just sort of sense of you know workaholism that's probably pretty unhealthy. Yeah. I mean. Again, when I when I'm talking about cartoonists, I really have only any knowledge or experience with sort of the alternative yeah. or underground cartoonists. I don't know what the psychology of of more of a mainstream. Uh, superhero. I, I suspect when you're working on a monthly book, that changes the math entirely. Yeah, yeah, and and there must just be different motivations too, uh, and 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 goals too. But of of the people that I have known and 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 the group that I sort of include myself with, I, I feel like a lot of us have come from somewhat chaotic childhoods or um, divorced parents or moving around a lot mm. or and I and I think. Uh, you know, or an unpleasant experience at, at school or whatever it might be. Are you be. talking about sort of what makes things insular? No, I'm talking about why a lot of us are drawn to the kind of work that yeah. makes you sit in a room by yourself and, and, and tries to very carefully organize life, you know, like literally putting something as nebulous and chaotic as life into little perfectly ruled out boxes. And, and world building. I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's definitely there's a form of escape. It's it's addictive too. I mean, I think that there's there's that feeling of you know the harder I work or the more time I put into this, the better it'll be, or the the more the world will approve of me, or, or you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of psychology to, to cartooning. I think you've gotten really good at at figuring out what to include and what not to include. I suspect to some degree that's having worked in the short story format for as long as you have, but. Killing and dying, the story in, in the book Killing and Dying mm-hmm. is is maybe the best example of that of any work that you've done. Oh, thanks. In terms of being able to tell a full story with the things that you've chosen not to include. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to, you know, don't want to give away t- uh, too much, although it's been out for a, a few years now. It's it's a play on words, mm-hmm. the, the title of the story. But um, you see the mother's progression throughout mm-hmm. the book and, mm-hmm. and then suddenly she's just not there. I mean, right. was that, was that you sort of, were, were you playing with the form? What, what was, what was the, the thinking that went into that? Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, that all the stories in that book were, were basically written and, and edited in my head for mm-hmm. a long time before they were put onto paper. I kind of go out of my way to avoid that experience of sitting down in front of a blank piece of paper and saying, now let me create my next book. You know, I, I, try and do as much as possible in my head while I'm doing other things so that as soon as I sit down, I can just go yeah. and start drawing. And that w- particular story, I think I had the, the more complete linear story very clear in my brain for a long time. And maybe some of the elliptical nature that you're describing came about in sort of a, a problem solving mode for me hmm. where I realized like this is the most fraught <laughs> subject matter I could possibly approach in terms of getting into maudlin someone literally dying of yeah, cancer. Sentimentality, yeah. corniness, all those things. It was I, I I sort of created the story really in a vacuum. And then when I started thinking of it in the context of of other media, like about how this has been covered in film and and, and prose I started getting very nervous about 
some of the cliches and, and all that. What's interesting to me, and it's just occurring to me now talking to you, is um, I don't know that you could have pulled it off in the same way in any other medium because you're able to – there are visual clues. Yeah. I don't know that there's any mention – even made no, of it no. in the entire thing. There's there's very there's a few very subtle things. Yeah. That, there's there's like I'd say there's about I don't know, ten things in that book that I was not sure if I was erring on the side of too much subtlety or too much obviousness. And I clearly erred on the side of too much <laughs> too much subtlety because <laughs> no one has ever brought them up or or, or picked, yeah. picked up on them. Um not just in that story. But um so there's a few things that that do allude to it in, in the dialogue, I think, at least in my mind. But um, I actually uh, sold the rights to that story, among hmm. among others, to a filmmaker. And I will be very curious to see what's what's done with it. Uh, because like you said, it really, I mean, it's it's not technically about, about comics at all, but in a lot of ways, it's very enmeshed in, in the form. They say that the, the best adaptations are made from short stories mm -hmm. but you really are in that case the difference between a short story and, and doing a, a full-length graphic novel is you're really putting that into the hands of the filmmaker in a much larger way than you would be otherwise sure yeah have you optioned things in the past no this was um this was part of my big uh experimental phase that when when i finished killing and dying which i never thought i would uh, you know, it just seemed like it was this insurmountable goal for me, not because I was working so hard on it every day, but because of life, the, the life things that I mentioned yeah. earlier. When I finished it, I just said, like, as soon as this is done, I'm going to not dive right into, you know, killing and dying part two or something like that. I want to do other kinds of work and other kinds of projects and say yes to things that in the past I'd said no to just because I didn't have the mental bandwidth to even explore or think about so in the past there have been inquiries about about adaptations and film rights and in hindsight i probably should have thought more deeply yeah. about some of those but at the time i was so frazzled and so focused on just getting my book done that i just i would just get on the phone and say like no just forget it but that's less less about i would assume time management on your part i, I don't know how large of a role you would ultimately even playing that and I, I've always gotten the impression that people who refuse to do that it's just because it's like this is something precious this means yeah. I, I had a very clear idea of what, what I was doing it's out in the world now and there's no way it can really come to fruition without being an entirely different product yeah no I, I, I I'm sure that that that's true no, I guess just in general having having kids and 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 all that it had such an impact on me as a person and 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 on my work and I feel like especially after spending so long working on killing and dying, I was just a lot more open to new new possibilities mm. that in the past I had just dismissed out of hand. And so when that offer came along, it wasn't like an immediate easy choice for me. I, I did the time to talk to people and research the, the people who were going to be involved in it. And um, at the end of the day, I sort of, it came down to me asking myself, you know, like when I'm lying on my deathbed, would I rather have had that experience <laughs> whether it's good or bad or whatever, or have not had it and sort of always been curious about it. Does having kids make you morbid? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think, I mean... And you it, think more about your own mortality. Yeah, I mean, I always did anyway. Yeah. <laughs> that was always a preoccupation of sure. mine, but uh, more so probably. I guess I, that shouldn't even be framed in such a morbid context, but I, I just meant that I think even if it's a not the experience that, I'm, I, that I would most hope for, I think I'm curious to have that experience more than, than just going through life wondering what would have happened if I yeah. said yes to that. Are you at a place where you're thinking about the next book? I'm working on it. You're working book. on the next book. I am, yeah. You'll be the first person aside from my wife to know about it, basically. <laughs> oh, well, are, are you willing to talk about it? Uh, not in terms of the content, sure. but in the fact that it exists. <laughs> is the approach similar, though? I mean, is, is, it a, is it a collection of short pieces again i wouldn't well i'm excited yes, now yes yeah. and no yes and no it, it's it's maybe more, a thematically it would, tied together it would be more of a piece than than killing and dying yeah. was the reason that you're the <laughs> second person in the world to know about it is because i again when i finished killing and dying i felt this like huge weight <laughs> lifted off of me because i committed to that book a long time ago mm -hmm. i signed a contract for it and i took an advance for it and agreed to a deadline. And long before the book was actually done, the advance was 
spent. Depleted, yeah. The, the deadline had passed. I was in a panic about both those things. Uh, and on a personal level, I feel, felt like I was letting down my publisher because I had already agreed to the date. Yeah. And so I just thought, like, I am not ready to get back into that situation again. And so basically what I've been doing is just kind of working in private on, on, on this book and without signing contracts or anything, setting deadlines or anything like that. And that's made the process a lot more yeah. enjoyable. <laughs> Did it feel at points like Killing and Dying wasn't going to ever come out? Yeah, definitely. I mean... What, what made it? What made that book specifically so difficult? Fam just the family thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because um, I was... Like I said, at the, at the start of it, I was supporting the family completely yeah. while my wife was finishing grad school and we had our two daughters. So you were putting it off for sort of more immediate pieces, illustrations, things like that? Yes, I had to do that to make to make quick cash. But yeah. also the hours that I needed to complete it were not at my disposal. So I have a lot of vivid memories of being in a darkened room with a baby trying to get it to go to sleep because if she went to sleep, then I could go to my room and get some work done. And of course, that stress in me was sort of transmitting to her and keeping her from going to sleep. <laughs> and then probably, you know, sleeping two to three hours a night it makes oh, yeah. it very hard to keep a steady hand, I imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't because the art was so <laughs> detailed or, yeah. the, or the stories were so hard to write or anything. It, was, it really was just a matter of finding the hours in the day to, to, to put it down on paper. Are you able to point to things in the book that really were spurred on by having a family? I mean, themes, things like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I when I started the book, my only goal was like, I want to do something different from shortcomings, which I considered to be the, the first, yeah. the previous book to yeah. that. And so I thought like, I don't want to create, I don't want to be locked into the same drawing style. So that's why I did those kind of different styles mm -hmm. for each story. And I also felt like I don't want to create a character or characters that would instantly be read as autobiographical stand-ins <laughs> for me, uh, which is what I faced a lot with the reaction to, to shortcomings. Yeah. Um, so I thought like I would just sit down and just do this kind of random assortment of stories, whatever occurred to me, and there would be no connecting theme or anything like that. But I soon thereafter became apparent and I think that that ended up infusing uh, a lot of the stories um, and that sort of is the very subtle over overarching the membrane of, of that book might have to do with parents and children in a yeah very... I mean, it's it's hard for me to put my thumb on anything you mm -hmm. know aside from maybe again the titular story uh -huh. there's a connection there but there's nothing there's nothing in the book about a an artist living in New York with no. two small children no it's um yeah I I, I went out of my way to avoid anything that looked too directly autobiographical. Yeah. But um, what ended up happening was uh, instead of transmitting like the day-to-day -day details of my reality, it was more like the mental, like the anxieties or the fears or the, the pleasures of what was going on in my life at that time worked its way into a variety of, of characters. There, there is something... I keep ending up on the main story but mm -hmm. I mean, there is something that that plays out there as far as parents parents expectations yeah. um being supportive and right. worrying that you're being too supportive yeah that that's that's the heart of it i mean it was written at a time in my life where my uh my first daughter was old enough to to ask to go to ballet class so so we, we you're so, you're already at that age you already have those fears oh at that yeah instantly yeah. i mean like i she was very young but she and her friend wanted to take this ballet class so i every i think every saturday morning i had to take her to this ballet class and, and watch her do it and go to these recitals yeah. and that instantly made me think not only about her as she grows up and the different endeavors that she would want to get into and how i would rea react to it but also started kind of moving my mind backwards through time, thinking about what the experience might have been like for my parents, mm. having this weird kid who was not interested in physical activity or <laughs> socializing or anything that I think that might have made them happy to see, you know, yeah. but instead wanted to sit in a room by himself and draw. And, and so, yeah, I was sort of, I, I, I think, thinking both about 
my daughter and the, the, the little kid version of myself and, and my parents all at once. Obviously, you've moved away from autobiography. I mean, your, your earliest stuff was, was really memoir. and Yeah. But why the, why the negative reaction when people were drawing parallels to your life? <laughs> I really hate to use this example for obvious reasons, but Woody Allen has a Woody Allen surrogate in every single thing he does. Right. He's still able to make, you know, very different movies. Right. But there's always, he's, he's always in those movies. I guess it depends on how well your <laughs> surrogate is received by the public. Sure. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I don't think that that would be, uh, very well received in in the present day in in a in a Woody Allen movie yeah. if if there ever is another one, um, and you know I I, I had the... thankfully you don't have those issues <laughs> no but I mean <laughs> I, I think in in his heyday or if you look at another filmmaker yeah. uh, or or artist who has that sort of stand in character if that stand in character is beloved and people think that's so funny and like then that that's encouraging but for <laughs> for me i had sort of a opposite experience with, yeah. with shortcomings and i um ended up feeling that i had it was my fault but i feel like i had uh subjected my myself to a, a, a sort of scrutiny that i was not comfortable mm. with did you ever have trouble putting yourself into other people's shoes i mean you know you've, you've never um you've never shied away from you know writing about women mm -hmm. writing about uh, characters who are very vastly different from you on a, on a personal level, but at the same time, there's a lot of potential to get things wrong. Sure. Was it, was it, was that, was that ever a fear of yours? Uh, always. And I think that that fear can lead to very bland work. Yeah. Like, I think you can worry so much about that, that you end up saying like, well, the only thing that I'm really an authority on is me. And then you have to just write very straight autobiography mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. There's enough books about writers writing about totally. writing. Totally. Yeah. Totally. You know, I, I think that's just a it's just an artist struggle in general, yeah. but, but but now more than ever about um, how how much do you want to reflect the reality of, of our of our society, yeah. uh, but also being respectful and 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 cognizant about not stepping on other people's toes or or uh, you know appropriating in a, in a disrespectful way or um so yeah it's 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 a tough it's a tough call does your wife play a role in that when when it comes to actually sort of trying to inhabit these characters and bouncing ideas off of people i, I assume it, it can't all just happen in that dark room <laughs> it mostly does. It does okay it mostly does my wife is a great editor uh and and but i don't really burden her with the the creative process mm. that much i think that I don't know. I, I, I guess uh, I, I, I've put out enough stuff that I feel like I would, I've, I've, I get a sense of the general reaction to, yeah. <laughs> to whatever I do. Uh, and I think I would, I mean, it's pretty clear that I have a readership that would let me know when I had <laughs> misstepped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I've, I think that's an important thing is to stay connected to that, to that feedback. I think that's a lot of times where artists, especially older artists start to get into trouble, which is where they, are so self-assured and so confident and perhaps so arrogant that they cut off their connection to critics of whether they're professional or not. And, and um, so for, for me, that's been really useful to, to keep my ears open to, to those kinds of things and, and to a degree, let it, let it affect me. I saw somewhere you described it as a California book. Mm -hmm, what, what does that mean? It means that uh, it really is, in a weird way, me kind of transporting myself back to the settings that I that I grew up with uh, on the West Coast um, that I still feel very much at home yeah. in and uh, feel like I can step into a lot easier than than even uh, a brooklyn based story right now are, are the stories that much different from coast to coast uh not so much that the stories are different but being able to write the dialogue and um draw the backgrounds and, yeah. and um the the california stuff comes like second nature to me and uh if i was to do all those same stories set in new york i would feel like I would have to do research and have to, to you know, get things fact-checked yeah. with real New Yorkers. It is funny. I've, you know, I've been here for 
12, 13 years mm-hmm. at this point. And you never stop feeling like a Californian. No, I, I, I sure don't. And, you know, the, uh, like even the, the image on the, on the cover of, of Killing and Dying is kind of an, it's not a real setting. It's an amalgam of a lot of different things. But, um, you know, I've met people out here who go like, oh, you really capture just like that horrible, like existential, depressive, you know, strip mall, strip mall nightmare of California yeah. or something. But I always feel like, no, that's that's like a nice drawing. I, I see that. <laughs> I see that setting and I feel very at ease and I feel. It's true, right? <laughs> There's two prominent Denny's in the book. And, sure. And I have nice memories. Yeah. I have nice memories from from the malls of California. Oh, yeah. Not the freeways as much. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I grew up in Fremont. Okay, that's not um, far. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's yeah, that's <laughs> that's that was my my childhood yeah. context for yeah. those things. Yeah, and, and I go back there. I never have had that feeling of like, oh, how did I ever live here? Yeah, it's, it's like I always land in in Oakland or whatever, and come out of the airport, and I go, oh God, here I am again. Yeah, I'm very happy. San Francisco is a little bit harder these days. Yeah. I never considered San Francisco to be my home. Yeah. I, I never spent a lot of time there. And even now when, when I go there, I'm completely lost. Like I don't know the geography at all. And it, it feels like a different world than, than where I grew up in. As somebody who draws covers for The New Yorker mm-hmm. and is a Brooklynite, I mean, do you do you see yourself staying here forever? I don't know about forever. I mean, for for a good chunk of time for sure, though, because yeah. we've really settled in here uh this is where we had our kids and and put them in school and i mean for me as 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 a when i was a kid i think the hardest thing for me to deal with was the times that i had to move and like start at a new school yeah. and and move into a new home and and all those things um and I know they're not great tragedies, and, and I'm sure my, my kids would, would be able to handle them. But um, I've sort of gone out of my way to create uh, more of a sense of stability than I had as a kid. So I think we're definitely settled here for, for, for the good. How long ago did you move? I moved to New York in, I think it was around 2004. Okay. Yeah. So you were already a, a professional Oh yes, yeah. at that point. So yeah. that, I mean, that must be a very different experience, I assume, than people you know coming here, going to SVA, oh, yeah. trying to start their career here. It must be scary. It must be, and it must kill a lot of careers. And and I, I talk about this quite a bit on the show, but how much the sort of living from day to day inhibits your ability to take creative risks. Mm-hmm. Um, you mean like the cost of living? Yeah, yeah. That, that you can't you can't quit your day job and yeah. and say i'm just going to you know draw on a month uh, for a month because there's there's no safety net yeah there must be some degree of that for you i mean you know what you, do you mean as far as um maybe you would be able to take more creative risks or not that you don't enjoy the illustrations but maybe you wouldn't have to do as much commercial work and you oh, could yeah. work on that 800 page graphic yeah. novel if you weren't living in brooklyn oh yeah no definitely i mean i i don't know if i would recommend <laughs> moving here to to yeah. a young aspiring artist um would you recommend being a cartoonist to a young aspiring artist i don't know <laughs> i don't know if i would recommend that either i mean that's that's the thing is like when i was talking about the stability that i'm trying to create for for my kids is that the the opposite the the lack of stability or the 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 transient nature of my childhood was totally crucial to me becoming a cartoonist yeah so for that i'm 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 grateful for that um and i feel like i'm making (laughs) a lot of choices that will not lead my daughters to become cartoonists (laughs) but to maybe having a a peaceful content life that does play a role again in the um in that main story of her wanting to be a stand-up comedian it's not even just the um the idea of oh she did trapeze school before but it's (laughs) like it's like this is not a path you want yeah. to go down. I want you to have a happy life, and this is not being a stand-up comedian is probably not a way to have a happy yeah, life. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I think that that was obviously at the forefront forefront of my mind at that point because I sort of felt like, well, now it all seems worth it, like because now be, yeah. I'm a professional cartoonist and I work for the New Yorker, and <laughs> and it seems. But you've seen so many p- people, and so I'm, I assume so many of your peers have fallen away. Yeah, over the years. that that's possible. I, I guess I also feel like 
there was a lot of luck involved. The fact sure. the fact that I got to this place where I'm where I feel like it was all worth it is not a guarantee for everybody. And again, in in hindsight, I I, I wonder if the, all the all the, the years that I spent trying to get to that point, uh, if they you know what what my life might have looked like if I had spent them doing other things. That's and, not a game you want to play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's it's I can be clear enough about it to think that basically I'm not encouraging my my children to yeah. to live the life that I did. I'm trying to, to to create a somewhat different life for them, even if it means them, you know, having a different kind of career, which which I think would be great. The difference between you and a lot of the cartoonists I, I talked to is you seem pretty happy and satisfied with what you're doing. I mean, you 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 seem to think that you've chosen the right path and you are generally happy. Per- most yeah. cartoonists feel like they they you don't, live you don't, with with deep regret. <laughs> you don't you don't feel like most cartoonists feel, feel like they live with deep regret or at least a pretty <laughs> you know as well as I do that yeah. it's a, a occupation that tends to attract depressive yes. people. Yes. Yes, definitely. I, I think if if I was that the 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 rewards of being a successful cartoonist for me would not be enough to make for a happy life, and and that's coming from someone who's been extremely lucky yeah. and have, has had a million uh, unpredictable lucky breaks and, and and lots of help from all kinds of generous people. Even still, I feel like if I was living alone and and just creating comics, that 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 I would not feel content with that as, as my life at the end of the day. Whereas on the other hand, I feel like if I had some other job, if I sold newspapers in a, in a kiosk, which which I always fantasize about doing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. It seems like... Uh, I'm sure that that wouldn't be a horrible job. <laughs> well, I'm just... But but having that, but also yeah. having the, 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 the experience of... of, of raising kids and everything. I think that would be a uh, more satisfying. That being a cartoonist or that your career is rewarding, but it's not the most rewarding part of your life. No, no. I mean, I think there was a, a f- definite good chunk of my life where that was true, where mm. where nothing else really mattered. But if, if something that I was working on came out well, I would feel like a, a complete person. Yeah. Or I'd, I'd take great joy in, in getting a positive <laughs> review or something like that. Um, but I, I do think that that has, has changed for me. There you go. That was Adrian Tomina, somebody I've been trying to interview for a really long time for whatever reason hasn't really lined up in spite of the fact that we both live in the same city. Glad we were finally able to do that. Really enjoy that conversation. Thanks so much to him for taking the time. Thanks to Drawn and Quarterly for setting that up. Uh, Adrian, of course, has a lot of wonderful work that I highly recommend you check out. You can start with the paperback version of Killing and Dying, which is out now on Drawn and Quarterly. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the show. If you like the program, there are a number of ways to support us. You can and rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Tumblr. That's riwildcast.tumblr.com, and that is the first and best place to get all of your riyl related information. If you have any feedback, it's riwildcast at gmail.com. And that's about all I got for this week, so stick around because we will be back just about this time next week with another episode of RIYL.